Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for an impromptu one. Quite big news, the UCI statement that came out today, Naira Quintana has been disqualified from the Tour de France 2022. We're going to unpack that statement, talk about Tramadol, which is why he has been disqualified from the Tour de France, and yeah, what this means for Arkea and him as well, because it's not an anti-doping rule violation. He hasn't been suspended. So it's well one of the most unique things we've sort of seen in a while in this space. But this show, as always, is brought to you by Zwift. Zwift Academy is back for 2022. Registration is open now. Whether you're aiming for a pro contract like Jay Vine or Neve Branfrey or just looking to kickstart your fitness with some structured sessions, Zwift Academy will help you get fitter and have more fun on the bike. There are six workouts to complete, either solo or in-group workouts with baseline rides to compare your progress before and after Zwift Academy. But here's the statement. Wednesday, August, two days before the world kicks off, the UCI announces that the Colombian rider Naira Alexander Quintana Rojas has been sanctioned for an infringement of the in-competition ban on using tramadol as set out in the UCI medical rules. Note that down. With the aim of promote, protecting the safety and health of riders in light of the side effects of this substance. The analyses of two dried blood samples provided by the rider on 8 and 13 July during the 2022 Tour de France, that's Planche de Belfi and Grenon stages, revealed the presence of tramadol and its two main metabolites. In accordance with the UCI medical rules, the rider is disqualified from the 2022 Tour de France. Presume his points are gone. We're going to discuss that. This decision may be appealed before the, uh, the forecast within the next 10 days. During 2022, many samples were collected as part of the tramadol program. And here's a bit of more of an explanation from the UCI. Infringements of the in-competition ban on using tramadol are offences under the, under the UCI medical rules. They do not constitute anti-doping rule violations as this is a first offence, Nairo Quintana is not declared ineligible and can therefore participate in competitions. I think, Benji, that's going to be surprising to people, sort of testing, quote-unquote, positive for a substance which is prohibited yeah. from the UCI, which yields no sort of suspension, just a disqualification. Yes, yeah, certainly. And... The aspect that we have to look into here is that tramadol has been banned since 2019 by the UCI itself across all disciplines, but it is not a substance that is banned by WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency. Like you said, the UCI has as punishments for that. First time you do it, you get a fine plus a disqualification from that race. The second time you do it, I think it was a five-month suspension and a third time a nine-month suspension for every single time afterwards, if I recall correctly as well. So it does conclude that the second and the following times that a rider does infer on that substance, that he's going to have an actual ban in UCI races. So if Quintana goes to La Vuelta, for example, has another incurrence on this rule, then he's going to be banned for five months, and if he does it again, nine months and so forth. But in this case, first time around, only a disqualification from the Tour de France, and basically a probably fine, according to the rules at least, so I'm guessing a fine will follow next to that. But there's also that aspect that you mentioned shortly in there. This decision may be appealed before the Court of Arbitration for Sport within the next 10 days. Like, for people that don't know, what is CAS? It's the it's, uh, the sports jurisdiction that the UCI rules, like if there's a dispute on the UCI rules, seated in Switzerland, that any decisions, it's like an independent. I don't actually know. It's a good question, Ben. It's just like an <laughs> independent Swiss court sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, whether he goes there, to me, I don't really see the upside. He just got a big contract extension unless... Arkea Samsic rip up that three-year deal. Him a three-year deal announced last week. Now, we don't know if they knew about this in advance or they found out when we did or an hour before this morning and Arkea have just extended this guy for three years and then he gets hit with this. If if they didn't know, that's like a nightmare scenario for Arkea Samsic and the sponsors. And people might be asking, what is Tramadol? Tramadol is it's an opioid pain medication. Um, for 
usually like pretty severe pain. Um, I once had tramadol and I just vomited straight afterwards when I broke my back in half. Um, but that's by the by irrelevant. What's curious <laughs> to me is, and what I don't understand, is this is on the UCI medical rule list. It's a prohibited substance, even though that's a loaded term, on the yeah. medical rules list. And yet, and, and, and the rationale seemingly, I'm trying to read into, why is this on the medical list and not on the prohibited substance list? Because it's not a wider prohibited substance. But I swear, like, can the UCI not put on, have prohibited substances which WADA don't have as prohibited substances, which would still be anti-doping rule violations like corticosteroid TUEs? Because if you take a corticosteroid TUE, no, sorry, you can't anymore, right? You can't take corticosteroids yeah. In competition, even with the TUE, that would be an anti-doping rule violation. But I think you can in other sports that are wilder sports. So why is this substance just on the medical list? That's what people are asking because the guys aren't just taking it. People don't just like, I want to wake up and take tramadol today. Like people take it because they (laughs) think it will help their performance or help indirectly with performance. Why else would you take anything, drink water, take a uh, paracetamol you you it will help with something so why is it on this medical list and there's studies not conclusive not extensive ones but there's a study like for example you just do a quick google search codeine and tramadol use in athletes and one of the studies revealed that tramadol improved 20 minutes cycling time trial performance by around five percent five percent that is huge but so like why is it on that list benji first of all do we know if that study for example is being made on athletes of top level whether they have that five percent to improve still like those details i would have to in-depthly read that study for for yeah, example it's probably not world tour athletes yeah but next to that apparently there's the aspect according to what is being suggested online right now based on this decision that it's due to these side effects. It's also said in that UCI media statement that it's due to these side effects of tramadol, to protect the riders. And what is being suggested by many is that it's due to potential dizziness that would make the rider a danger for other riders in the race. Now, I don't rate myself a doctor, but I find that a logical explanation. I don't know if that's the actual explanation for it being in the medical rules aspect, but it would be a logical explanation for it. Isn't this the same as when blood doping or something was kind of allowed, but you just couldn't go above 50 hematocrit? And they were like in the 90s when, it, and that was to protect the riders. It's like, all right, <laughs> you can do this, but just don't take the piss and make your blood too thick. And, yeah. you know, because that's actually going to be a danger to you. Like, isn't the rules as they're set up? Not really, because you can't take a little bit of tramadol. It's if you take tramadol, you get disqualified, but you don't get an anti-doping ban. It's it's very curious, um, and I'm surprised it's come up. Like, it's come up with a big rider from the biggest race that we're now having this discussion. Like, I don't know. I don't. I don't see a strong rationale for why a substance that isn't on the anti-doping rule. Not. I'm not saying that. Quintana should be banned because the rules as they stand or stood before the tour, that did they didn't say that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's odd. It's a bigger discussion though, as in like the rules and the anti-doping list evolved throughout the years. Like stuff gets added and probably, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if stuff gets removed at certain points. I don't actually know based on new studies, but s- certainly stuff gets added to that list across the years. We had the Bahrain uh, storyline narrative back in the day with the Tizanidine or whatever it was called. Like, that was not on the doping ban list. Like, at some point, there is a possibility that in five to ten years, a product like that is on the ban list. We don't know that right now. Will Tramadol be on the ban list in the future? We don't know that right now. So it's hard to discuss that aspect, I think. And, you know, for people that don't know, Tramadol has been used widely in the Peloton for a long time. Uh, before it's banned and like for example there was an interview from former team sky writer michael barry just quoting from a cycling weekly article and he said well they were quoting from a telegraph article and he said (laughs) don't know if it's true but this is what michael barry said i loved my time with the team i had a great experience there 
But ethically, I really started questioning the use of the tramadol and the sleeping pills, especially when you see the younger riders using this stuff heavily. If we went into a medical clinic and just asked their GP, they probably wouldn't give these out, and that's not ethical. He rode for Sky from 2010 to 2012, and that was, I think, a 2017 interview. So a bit of a gap, but yeah, it's clearly been used legally for quite a while, maybe under a TUE. I'm not sure if you needed a TUE for tramadol before. Um, and then it got banned. So that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that what once was legal, once it's not permitted, that's it. So Quintana's Tour de France has gone, Benji. Coincidentally, I mentioned those two days. Planche de Belfi, he lost 51 seconds. But Grenon, that was one of his best performances ever. That Col de Grenon stage, people don't remember. Micah was pacing, dropped everybody except top maybe six guys and Quintana was like this ain't quick enough and chased yeah. after Warren Bargui he came second on that stage only Vingegaard who was flying remember the historical stage but Quintana was unbelievably good on that stage so any coincidence no idea this is that is the date 13 July when they one of the two that um showed up tramadol in his sample so is disqualification it's a month after no two three weeks after the tour I feel like, I don't know, what does a disqualification do? I guess it, does he remove, he gets a fine, Benji, does he lose prize money? But he's already got the contract extension. So what's the, I don't know, it's just weird, a weird punishment um, for for that. What Arkea do lose, though, is the points, I think. They lose 450 UCI points, which brings Less them stages? back in. Less the UCI points from stages? Yeah, yeah, 450 plus. So second on ground was 50, GC was 400, and I think he might have had three or some, a little few here or there. So it's at least 450 gone. And yeah. now they're back in the mix with Cofidis and Bike Exchange, although they have a good team to get them out. Um, how do you think the Archaea Samzik sponsors react to this in terms of like, if you're, if put them, if you're in their shoes, it's not an anti-doping rule violation. We've said this now five times. It isn't. Even if you think what he did was was wrong, well, it's against the rules. Do they react that way if you're a sponsor? Because the public, the French public is probably going to take it that way. He's tested positive for a substance that's not permitted. Yes, yeah, certainly. And there's another aspect to this. We've spoken about multiple organizations in this sport so far. We've spoken about UCI, the government body. We've spoken about WADA, World Anti-Doping Agency. Us being a uh, court of whatever it was, arbitrary, whatever that you can go to and say, I disagree with the appeal, whatever yep. that you can appeal to. Now, there's also an organization, the MPCC, Mouvement pour uh, um, Cyclism Credible. I'm pretty sure that's the definition that they have. And their point is basically that it's a voluntary thing that a team can join. And if you join the MPCC, then you hold yourself to certain rules within that. Now, they have very specific rules, the MPCC. Like, for example, they have that you provisionally suspend any rider that tested positive. A rider that tested positive and was suspended more than six months, you can't hire until two years after. Like, they've got in total 10 rules like that. Having gone over the rules, I don't see anything specifically mentioning something called, like, a medical rule being broken. No, so there isn't. Does that mean that Arkea, who is part of the MPCC, does not necessarily need to act? But is it morally correct if they don't act? It's well, difficult. Well, that's the eh? thing. Can leave this. This is why a lot turns on it being a medical rule violation, because if the rider contract says the team can suspend you for an anti-doping rule violation, well, this isn't that. The MPCC rules, which uh, I've got the English ones up, again, <laughs> the language they all use is positive test results in the context of biopassport, an indirect doping detection method, and like prohibited methods or substances under the WADA rules, which again, this isn't that, or anti-doping rule violations, or cortisol. So NPCC has but, had cortisol rules for a long time. So I don't see where the NPCC can really do anything to Katana either. In the definition on the website of the NPCC, it says 
We are an association aiming at defending clean cycling, transparency, blah, blah, blah. We are also a whistleblower on corticosteroids, tramadol, still knocks, and mechanical doping. If you've got that in your mission statement as the MPCC and Arkea joins that, it indirectly, in my opinion, says that something needs to happen if tramadol is included in this. I think there's some provision in the MPCC rules where if something like this happens in a team that is an MPCC member, at the next meeting of MPCC, RK have to do a please explain to the board <laughs> or something. I think it's in the rules. They have to explain yeah. what's going on, what happened. I don't, I don't know. Um, but there's also, there are some very sort of subjective, you know, ruining the image of cycling things, which you could argue this falls under doing the, you know this happening at the Tour de yeah. France where the MPCC or the team could act where you know damage to the image and credibility of cycling like has he done that that's all written in the context of WADA anti-doping rule violations and some of the MPCC rules I will take this opportunity to say are um, I would say almost counterproductive and outrageous like the MPCC seems to think that it can directly sue riders itself for damaging the image of cycling if they have an anti-doping <laughs> rule violation. I'm like, I don't think you can do that. You can say you can do that in the rules, but I don't think you can do that. Um, so really, MPCC, it's a bit toothless, Ben. Do you remember Astana, Nibali? Oh, was it? Nibali's Wait, the only what? rider, I think, to win a Grand Tour whilst on MPCC. And then I think they, was it Astana just got booted from it? They, you just left it. There's nothing, if you don't like it, yeah. You just leave um, NBCC if you don't like it. So there, I'm not sure. What do you think RK will do, though? What What would you do? Because this is like damage control. It's not the worst case scenario, no. but it's not the realm you want to be in. You've just extended the guy three years. I'll repeat, like Quintana's extended till the next whole UCI point cycle. Yeah, and they announced need him. yesterday. Like... They yeah. publicly announced it in the, in the last two days before today. Like, it is going to be the worst time marketing wise to have this happen to your new extension of like a major rider in your team. But legally, for the UCI, he's allowed to ride La Vuelta. He's on paper riding La Vuelta. Will Arkea act and not have him ride La Vuelta? I think if he rides La Vuelta and he does decent, then Arkea is going to get shit on left and right. So I don't know what decision needs to be when it comes to the Vuelta, and I'm glad I'm not the one making it. Didn't Froome, I mean, Froome rode the Giro, didn't he, One when he still hadn't had his um, Vuelta test overturned yet? Like, at the point he rode the Giro, he hadn't had the test overturned, so he's under that cloud, and Venue is like, I welcome Chris Froome. Please come to the Giro <laughs> Italia. I remember that. So... Yeah, I mean, you say that, but at the end of the day, we have to reiterate, this is a painkiller that has been allowed a lot in the last decade. For the majority of the last decade, a lot of rides have taken. I do think, like I've seen people saying, oh, it's a painkiller. What does it matter? It's like, well, I just read, like, first of all, it can't be good for you. Like, that is true. Taking that, taking that shit and riding can't be good for you. Um, I would think, again, not a doctor, but I'm assuming that. And second of all, does it have a performance benefit? It could. So, mm -hmm. and it's prohibited. So, I think you should. I think they should keep him in for the Vuelta, though, because if you take him out, you're just delaying the pain, aren't you? Or do you think if you take him out and he does the Italian classics or something, people kind of forget about it in a month? I don't know. Does it hurt their credibility within MPCC itself, being a member of that, if they don't act and like professionals? He's provisionally suspend them for this for example i don't know how far that goes i don't know the specifics of every single rule in the mpcc when it comes to the public they're gonna get shit on regardless but if he doesn't write a velta that's gonna be less ah uh, i don't know what their decision should be and i don't know what their decision in the future should be i think it's just annoying that it's a medical rule and not a doping rule at the top because that makes it so difficult to judge the situation even for us well even if because, the team wants to do something benji even if yeah. they want to they might not contractually be able to so even if they do but they're like well it's not an anti-doping rule violation well, so we can't do anything if you as a team are part of the mpcc 
Is it possible that you as a rider signing for that team have a segment in your contract that is an MPCC segment saying that you can't do certain stuff within the team that breaks MPCC rules? I mean, but what MPCC rule is he broken? I don't know. I don't know all the MPCC yeah, rules. Yeah, in I don't think he's broken her. one. Like, so I don't think there's, it's going to be tough to really do anything. Um, and that's why I don't think you'll take it to CAS because it might not really matter for him. He loses prize money from the tour. He gets a small fine. He loses the sixth in the tour on his Palmares. It's not like he won a stage. RK is the one that loses all the points. Quintana's got the three year extension. Um, but it is. It is interesting that, you know, riders will see now this is the benchmark. This is what happens if a rider, te- um, what, what language they use, um, the presence of tramadol, if they have that in their system during competition. Now, whether I wonder, Benji, this is the Tour de France. I, I don't know. Are they really, there are 120 tests for tramadol at the Tour. Are they taking these tests in the February races, like I'd be surprised if they're doing all these tests in all the races. I could be wrong, hopefully. You're right. You're right. They're not doing this in all the races. Really? I saw something on the UCAT website today, and I sent that to you, but I forgot all the details. But I think it mentions a sp- specific amount of races throughout the year, including the Vuelta being one of them. I think it was mainly World Tour races where they did the specific testing and i think i also read somewhere that was dbd testing a new method of testing um dried blood i got testing it. I or got something it. okay tour of britain ride london tour of yorkshire does that ex- exist tour of scotland <laughs> cycle classic tour de france vuelta uh that was what they said but that was in march 2019 what a weird lists well this is from ucad so maybe they don't say every single race but and some BMX ones. But yeah, I, I doubt it's at every single race. So I don't know, maybe it's still happening in the Peloton and guys have been flying under the radar with it at dot pro or dot one race, dot two race, whatever. And then they come to the tour, do the same thing. Bang. You don't realize they're also testing for tramadol. Um, but yeah, let us know what you think. It's a really, it's a really interesting one from like, you know, sort of lawyer's perspective. It's, it's not cut and dried. Well, it is like, he's not, He's not ineligible. He's not suspended. He's been disqualified. The rule, the sanction has been what it has been. But it's really interesting from a why questioning in the future. Why is this different from substances on the anti-doping rule violation list or prohibited substances list? That's what's really interesting to me. And I need to go back and look why this ended up on the medical rules list, not the ADRV list. But yeah, that's Quintana. Um Will we see him at the Vuelta? I'm not sure. We haven't seen the Arkea Samtic yet. This is an emergency podcast, even though I didn't ring the fire alarm. Um, but let us know down below. We'll move on to now. Egan Bernal returns to competition after his horrendous accident earlier this year when he was on the time trial bike and he ran into the back of a bus training at home, sustained severe injuries. He's back, not in the Vuelta, not in the Italian Classics, in the Tour of Denmark. Uh, which is as pancake flat just about as you can get. And we saw him on stage one, a 222K stage, welcome back, riding on the front as a domestique for his Ineos teammates. They've got some engines here, um, Kwiatkowski, Sheffield, uh, and Swift and Thomas. And he did the TT today and did do a great performance, um, you know, 50 or something, but did the TT today. I need to check out maybe what his position looks like, whether it's changed or anything, but... It's good to see him back, Benji. Big superstar of the sport, and his numbers have been looking pretty good in training. So, yeah, we, did you think he'd – I didn't think he'd do the Vuelta. Vuelta was just – it's too much, 21 days, and there wasn't enough time. When he didn't do Burgos, I was like, he can't do Vuelta. Yeah, I did not believe in, in the Vuelta. I think we said at the start of the year when the incident – when the accident happened in the first place that – we did not see a imminent return in cycling, not for the Tour de France, obviously, and not for the Vuelta. And throughout the year, I believe that became more clear and more clear. I think they even stated at some point that the Vuelta was not going to happen. Certain people brought it up as another possibility afterwards. But towards the end of the year, knowing that he had so limited racing before a potential Vuelta, I saw the Vuelta as completely impossible in that regard. Now, when it comes to the rest of like 2022, calendar-wise... I don't really know what to expect. I'm looking at Denmark, potentially Deutschland tour as like an option afterwards. Like 
I'm looking at like one week races to gradually up the racing again and finish off 2022 with some racing. I don't know if that means that he's going to be hunting for an Italian classic somewhere. I don't know if that's going to be the case. But there's also not that many races left in 2022. Let's be honest about it. So if I have to be honest about the schedule for Bernal, I'm looking at 2023. I think he should slowly but surely build up towards 2023 because the accident was pretty severe. So it would be crazy to hop up and try and force something imminently just after coming back from racing. Very similar to how Remco immediately tried to get something at a Giro, for example, after a severe accident and then had to require like starting from zero in the offseason afterwards. So I hope they gradually build up towards 2023 and that we see Dare him returning to a Grand Tour, whether that's the Giro or the Vuelta. Is it going to be the Tour de France? I don't know. Like, it's hard, you know, because we don't know what level he's going to return at. You talk about his training numbers. Like, in what effect do you mean that it's good, for example? Is that... Compared, oh, he was, compared just, to, he was yeah. just doing like 6 for 20 or something, or 5.8 for 20. Like, good, like, decent pro numbers, not peak numbers. Yeah. Not like, oh, my God, this guy's about to top three Grand Tour numbers. Just like, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. not someone with a broken leg. That's someone riding at a pretty good level, uh, yeah. doing good kilometers. He sacrificed a lot. He stayed in Europe. I think his mother has been unwell. Um, and he sacrificed a lot this year. So I think before the winter break, I think he's going to want to get a result somewhere. I really do. I don't think he's done all this to not get a result. Even if it's it's not going to be the Vuelta, obviously. It's, it's not going to be world champs. Uh, he probably will do Lombardia, but I think he will want – I uh, uh, races one before, and I think it'll be the Italian circuit he'll focus on. There's Toscana, Sabatini, Memorial Pantani, Matteotti, bit of a break, and then uh, Giro dell'Emilia, Tre Valle Varesine, Gran Piemonte, and then Il Lombardia. Now he, he's done really well. Like, even when he was in Adandrone, he always did well there. Um, he's familiar with that circuit, so I think he's going to do that, and I think he's going to really try and win, win a race. Now, I don't know if Piemonte is. Hilly again this year, and Torino keeps swapping. But yeah, I hope to see him there. And I, I think he will be competitive in the back end of uh, September and the start of October, especially in those sort of two dot, uh, 1 .1, uh, 1 dot pro races. Lombardia, maybe not, depending on who goes. But yeah, good to see. And I agree with what Benji said. Maybe it's good that he didn't do the Vuelta and rush back and, and did that. And they got a full team there anyway but that's all from us today bit of a, a news roundup prompted by the Quintana news which you wanted to unpack we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you with the Vuelta stage one on Friday ciao